So I'm, I'm going to talk to you about a work that we're currently uh, finishing, hopefully, uh, trying to constrain uh, the amount of coal overshooting uh, in low mass stars using Kepler data. So this work was done in collaboration with uh, many other people, most of whom uh, are in the room today. So we know that there are several uh, physical processes that uh, are currently not taken into account in, st in uh, standard stellar models and that are capable of extending the size of convective cores. So we immediately think about core overshooting, but it's also the case of semiconvection, rotational mixing, etc. We've heard about this uh, during this conference. Uh, and it's a problem because convective cores play the role as a, of a reservoir for nuclear reactions. So if you don't know the size of the core properly, uh, you, you don't know the evolution, and you, you, you end up having large uncertainties on stellar ages. And I don't think I need to convince you that it's important. We've heard about this, not only for stellar evolution, but also to, to study planet formation and, and, and stuff like that. And we, so it's particularly needed for the Plato mission. So uh, the way we usually treat this is in, in 1D stellar models, we usually resort to a uh, parametrized, simplified approach uh, uh, to take into account all these uh, processes. So the, the simplest one and the most commonly adopted is just to extend the size of the core over uh, a fraction of the pressure scale height to extend the size of the mixed core. And uh, this fraction is called the overshooting parameter. It's called the overshooting even though it's a proxy for all these other parameters. So my apologies, I'm going to talk about core overshooting, but please hear uh, the effect of all these uh, processes all together. So it's a very simplified approach, but unfortunately for now we, are, we, we don't really have the data to really constrain it, or perhaps we have, but uh, we need to go a little further to understand this. So there are other uh, ways of modeling it, and perhaps at some point we can uh, tell the difference between all that. So there are already uh, constraints that exist on core overshooting. I'll be very fast, but we have uh, uh, open clusters uh, can tell us uh, things about that because the location of the turnoff in color magnitude diagrams is uh, dependent on uh, the amount of core overshooting. Uh, eclipsing binaries also, if you know the mass and the radius, you can try to constrain uh, the, the amount of core overshooting. Uh, so uh, these methods uh, usually lead to the need of, an, of extended cores, and the most uh, commonly quoted value is an overshooting parameter of about 0.2. Uh, something that's interesting also is that uh, several studies hinted towards the possibility of uh, having the, the overshooting parameter that increases with stellar mass, especially for lower mass. Uh, so, so here uh, it's not very clear. It's a scarcely populated uh, region. Uh, so, and of course now we have seismology that can uh, help and contribute to this question with Corot and Kepler. So th th we heard about the uh, evidence for uh, extended convective cores in several main sequence targets, both from Corot and Kepler. So I quoted some of them here, both for uh, low mass stars and for uh, massive uh, B stars and, and, and stuff like that. But those are only for individual targets and we're still lacking a consistent study uh, that studies a larger number of stars and tries to determine how this overshooting parameter depends on, on, on other stellar parameters. So, how can seismology probe the size of cores? So we've heard uh, since dur during the beginning of this conference about glitches. Uh, at, this, at the boundary of the core, there's a jump in the chemical composition, and this induces a glitch in the sound speed profile. And acoustic modes are sensitive to that type of glitch. It's been known for a long time that mode frequencies oscillate as a function of the radial order. And that's particularly well seen in uh, the small separation between L equals zero and L equal one modes, which is very sensitive to the core. And Roxburgh and Voronsev showed that if you divide this by the large separation, it has the nice advantage that you're almost immune to uh, the near surface layers. And so you uh, have less trouble with near surface effects and you can compare models and observations directly, which is very interesting. So uh, here is an example of the R01 ratios, these ratios here for 1.15 solar mass models. And as you see that uh, for the larger values of the overshooting, you have a convective core. It induces this oscillation I was talking about before. And the interest is that the period of this oscillation is directly related to the location of the glitch. So you have a way of probing the size of the core. So you would potentially obtain model independent measurement of the location of the size of the core. Only the problem is that here I showed the, the observational range over which you, we detect modes. And it's only a fraction of this oscillation. So this is really a problem to get model independent measurements. Uh, although uh, Margarita and Isa have been working on this and they showed that in specific conditions you could obtain information, in particular on the intensity of the glitch. But here we're gonna focus on what we can obtain if we accept to be model dependent. 
So we'll focus on this, uh, th this range. Uh, in the observational range, uh, in fact, the, 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 the ratios are very well fitted by parabola. Uh, so I show here how they evolve with time uh, for a one point, uh, I think it's from 1.2 solar mass star, from ZAMS to post main sequence, and you see that the, the fit to parabola is, is quite good. Uh, several studies have already advocated to use the mean value of the ratio, which I call here A0, and the mean slope, which is here called A1, uh, to actually probe the core size. And th there were some, uh, for example, the paper by, by Victor, uh, who, who did this for one Kepler, mass, Kepler main sequence star and showed that uh, there, the need for an extended core. So, but those were done for individual stars. And the idea here was to check uh, can we, uh, how efficient is this diagnostic uh, and can we test it with uh, different stellar parameters. Uh, so for this purpose, we built a grid of models using the, the code CESAM. Uh, with varying mass, age, metallicity, helium abundance, and of course, core overshooting. And for each model, we computed the modes with a uh, LOSC and uh, performed uh, fits to the, uh, to the ratios. And so the idea was, as I said, to validate this diagnostic and also to determine a list of uh, the most promising Kepler targets to go and take, take them and work on them. And uh, of course, uh, then we need to interpret these data and the grid of model can, can be helpful for that. So before I go into details about the grid of model, I want to show you just a little bit how the R01 ratios vary with time. So this is a 1.2 solar model. So it has a convective core uh, at the ZAMS. Uh, but the point is that at the ZAMS, you're still chemically homogeneous. So you don't have a glitch yet. So you don't have this oscillation I was talking about before. The red part here is the observational range. Uh, so I will now animate it and let you see what, it, uh, what happens uh, when, when, when time evolves. So you see that the oscillation kicks in uh, its amplitude increases because you're building your gradient of chemical composition. And uh, the observational range is shifting to lower frequency because new max is decreasing. And so this is the, the evolutionary tracks that you get in the A1, A0 plane. An interesting thing is that in the post, when you reach the post-main sequence, the, the, um, the range of observations goes to the left part of this first maximum and then A1 becomes positive. So that's a way of uh, determining the evolutionary status. Uh, I'll come back on it later. So you have these C shapes, uh, evolutionary tracks. What happens if you, if, if you increase the amount of overshooting, you change the core size, and you see that you have very different tracks in this A1, A0 plane, which is why people said that it could be used to, to, to uh, determine the amount of overshooting. But th this is just for one set of physical parameters. Now what happens if we include all the other parameters? So if I do it in here, there will be curves all over the place and we can't see anything. So one idea to, uh, to, to try to see what's going on is to, to say that, okay, for when we have access to observations, we also have access to large separations. So it makes sense to uh, plot these things at a certain large separation. So for each evolutionary track, now I get only one point. Uh, so I'll show you what we get. Um, so those are uh, for different large separations. As I was saying, uh, to the color codes indicates the amount of overshoot. The squares show you stars with a convective core, crosses stars without a convective core, and the models in the post-main sequence are circled. So if you start with the higher large separation, uh, those are only uh, low-mass unevolved stars. So they either don't have a convective core or they are too young to, so that the glitch is already here. So you end up with a, a sort of degenerate uh, points in the A1, A0 plane. And unless the amount of overshooting is quite big, like 0.2, it, it looks uh, uh, not, uh, the perspective to, to probe the convective core are not so good. If you, if you decrease the large separation, you see that you have different populations. You, the lowest mass stars now are in the post-main sequence. And, uh, uh, and uh, you see that they occupy a, a location in the A1, A0 plane, which is very different from that in the main sequence, which gives you the prospect of telling the difference between um, main sequence stars and post-main sequence stars. And something that is in interesting in here is that for the main sequence stars, so now they have, they have convective cores, uh, and uh, the location of points with 0, 0.1, or 0.2 overshoot, they hardly, even, they hardly overlap. So this gives you the prospect to actually tell which overshoot you have. So I insist that here, this includes models with metallicities ranging from minus 0.5 dex to plus 0.5 dex. So for a particular star, we have spectroscopic measurements, so we know the metallicity better than that. So the prospect of telling the overshooting using these diagrams is even better than it shows in here. 
And if you further decrease the large separation, the separation between the, the, the different locations in this diagram is even clearer. Um, so this leads us to a couple of targets. Oh, whoa. Okay. Uh, so uh, for, for a couple of targets, we, we needed to have stars evolved enough uh, so that a grad mu has had time to build, but not to evolve so that we don't have mixed modes, because then the ratios are uh, harder to, they, they can be interpreted this way. Uh, so this was the rough cut that we made in a large separation. We went hunting for stars among the Chaplin and collaborators paper. Uh, uh, and we also picked only the stars for which we have a good frequency resolution. That means a lot of Kepler quarters. We ended up with about with four, uh, 24 targets. So we extracted the modes. I won't go into details because this is routine now. We used maximum likelihood estimation for that. We picked only the highest signal to noise ratio modes. So no problem with that. Uh, and for each of the stars, we uh, built the ratios and uh, performed polynomial fits. Uh, so now what, it give, what does it give when we compare it to the grid of models? Uh, so we did this for the 24 targets, and the first thing that we observed is that uh, in these uh, diagrams uh, here, for each star, uh, the, models are, uh, the models that reproduce the large separation of the observations, uh, uh, the spectroscopic uh, metallicity, uh, and uh, they, uh, which agree with the seismic mass uh, derived from scaling laws. And the yellow stars correspond to the place where uh, the observations put the stars. Um, the first good surprise that we had is that for the 24 targets, the, the, the measurements always fell in a place where, which was already populated by models. So that means that we always have a model that reproduces the classical properties and the general trend of the R01 ratios. Uh, as expected, we could determine the evolutionary status for most stars, 22 out of, the, out of the 24. So 12 of them are main sequence stars, 10 of them are clearly post-main sequence, and two of them are in the gray area where we don't know whether we can tell. Uh, and among the, the, the main sequence stars, uh, eight of them fall clearly in a place where they have a convective core. So this is one of them, uh, which is clearly among the convective core stars uh, and not in the post-main sequence. Here is a clear post-main sequence target. So if we focus on the stars which have a convective core, uh, it seems very clear that we can tell the overshoot. Here it's uh, around 0.1. We have here two stars around 0.15, and this one is the only one we have which is consistent with an overshoot as high as 0.2. Um, so what we can tell here is with these eight stars, in fact, we have a very consistent picture of the core overshooting. First of all, all the targets require overshooting. None of them fall in the zero overshooting section. Second of all, uh, none of the targets point toward a larger overshoot than 0.2. Um, so they're all between 0 and, and 0.2. And only one st uh, star is consistent with uh, an overshoot of 0.2. It happens to be the most massive star of our sample, 1.37. So that was clearly something that we thought might have something to do uh, with the uh, tendency of a core overshooting with, uh, with stellar mass. Uh, so to check this, we went a little further. Uh, we started from the grid of models and we performed the optimizations using the Levenberg Marquard algorithm. Uh, so this was advocated by Andrea and, uh, and Josefina. Uh, and it works very well. Uh, and the advantage of having done the grid of model first is that we could start from the best model that we had in the grid. And it's also an advantage because then we know that we have less chances of falling into a secondary minimum. And the advantage of running this is, of course, to get more precise estimates of the overshoot and of the mass. Uh, uh, and for this, we included the classical constraints that we had, and we also included all the seismic constraints. I talked very little about the A2 parameter, the uh, second order uh, parameter in the, uh, uh, in the parabola. Here it was included. And so classical free parameters. And what we get here is the following. Uh, so we have here the, the mass that is estimated from the models, and here the overshooting. So we only have eight points there, but it really seems like there is a clear trend of the amount of overshoot that we need to reproduce the seismic uh, ratios uh, with, uh, with stellar mass. So this needs to be further checked, of course, but this is the first time that we actually get a grip on this uh, dependency uh, in, this range, uh, in this range of mass. Uh, and if I have just a... A few seconds more, yes? Okay, uh, one other thing that we can say is that we can also work with the post-main sequence targets. Uh, as, we, as I said, there are targets which we know are in the post-main sequence. 
but if you increase the amount of overshooting after a certain after a certain amount of overshooting then it extends the lifetime in the main sequence and so you end up with stars in the main sequence when seismology tells you that the star is actually in the post main sequence so uh, for uh, all the targets that are in the post main sequence i tried to uh, check what happens if i increase the amount of overshooting at which point the star jumps to the main sequence and uh, for six of the targets uh, this limit is below 0.2 but for the six of targets where I could do this, uh, the, the, the limit is below 0.2. So you see the chi-square here. Here, these models are around 0.2 are in post-main sequence, and they're excluded. The chi-square jumps uh, very high. So I, I, I've plotted them as arrows, and they are lower mass stars. So they don't really help us for the, ten, for the trend of overshooting with stellar mass. But still, they, they, they comfort us that for this uh, 0.2 limit of overshoot, here we have 14 targets that tell us the, exactly the same thing. Um, so this is a short summary. We've shown that the, the, this, uh, uh, this diagnostic works uh, for stars that are uh, evolved enough but not too evolved. We can get evolutionary status. We can measure the convective core if it exists, and we applied it to 24 targets. Just a quick word on the uh, perspective of this work. Of course, what we want to do is to try to calibrate this amount of overshooting. We want to be able to tell, okay, for now we're not able to really model uh, core overshooting or semi-convection or etc. But seismology tells us that the extent of uh, convective cores should be about this thing. So this is just the start for that. Uh, and this could work. This could be important, for example, for Plato to measure this, the, the ages of stars. Uh, I, w I would like to stress that this is, of course, as I said, model-dependent results. So uh, one of the things that we need to do to wrap up this study is to study the, the impact of uh, changing different parameters and including different codes. That's what we're doing with uh, Margarita, with Victor, and, and other collaborators. Uh, and also we need to study uh, how overshooting is implemented in different models. We, we saw very recently discussing with Victor that uh, uh, core, uh, cores with overshoot in SESAM are a bit uh, larger than they are uh, in, in one of the code that he showed. That, so we need to really uh, study all these different codes to be able to provide a really uh, usable uh, calibration. And we can ex also extend this study to F stars, uh, even though the modes are harder to the frequent mode frequencies are harder to extract. So thank you for your attention. Questions for Sebastian? Yes, several. Um, um, first of all, just a puzzle. Uh, you just said you'd got post-main sequence stars in the sample. Hadn't they got mixed? Modes. Oh, that, that's a good question. And so yes. you couldn't get a, a ratio. That, that puzzled me too, because I, th I thought that once they're in the post-main sequence, they got to have mixed modes. It's true for uh, stars uh, about around 0.2 or 0.3 solar mass star. But uh, if you go below, you, you, have, uh, you can be in the post-main sequence and, no, and not yet have mixed well, modes. I suppose it depends what you mean by post-main sequence. Huh? Um, Oh no, no, no. oh, no, they are in the post-main sequence, no doubt about that. They're past the turn-off, but they don't have mixed modes yet, not, not in the observational range. And are they in shell-burning phase yet? Yes, 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 definitely so. Yeah, I was surprised of this too. But so this is one of the reasons why this diagnostic could be helpful um, for evolutionary My states. main question really is uh -huh. model, modeling of overshooting. Yeah, I, I expect that your this. overshooting is purely chemical mixing not entropy mixing. So it's not extending the actual convective core. It's just saying there is mixing beyond yes. the Schwarzschild boundary. Uh, and as you're probably aware, this is not something I like or agree with, uh, nor does John Paul, actually. Uh, but uh, I understood in the past that the French code had got the ability to have uh, entropy overshooting as well as just chemical overshooting. You mean the Jean-Paul Zahn treatment? No, 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 the, whatever you call the standard French code, what's it called? Yes, Cézanne. Yeah, There's a, there was a version of Cézanne that had full overshooting. Uh, I don't know whether there still is, but yes, I thought okay. there was in the past. I use, uh, yeah, the, the, what I use is chemically homogeneous in the overshoot region and adiabatic gradient. Uh, well, if you do that, the overshooting it is better, at least you know, only in a simple, not extensive study, but a simple study, is better modeled by increasing the core mass by a fraction. Yeah, of the okay. Core mass. So, 
a comment on this. Uh, as you saw, uh, usually the overshooting is taken as a fraction either of the pressure scale height or of the core radius, if the core radius is smaller than the pressure scale height. And in fact, for these... Yeah, I, I'm going to this. Uh, for the, these low mass stars, the core is small, and I checked, and in most of their evolution time, the radius of the core is in fact smaller than the pressure scale height. So you extend, in fact, it, this uh, corresponds to extending the, 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 the core radius. But then extending the core radius by 10% uh, is like extending the core mass by 30%. So you can think of it as an extension of core mass. It's really, uh, it's really equivalent, especially for these low mass stars. Yes. But we can discuss this uh, further. Sebastian. Yes. Um, looking at your equation there and the plot that you had with the trend as a function of mass, uh -huh. um, well, it, it looks, yeah, it looks to me like you already are in the F stars. But it seems to me there are a couple of core overshoot measurements astroseismically for B stars already, which are yeah. much more massive. And they're also about 0.2, aren't they? Yes. The, you're referring to the De Groot et al. paper. Uh, and uh, oh, and, and earlier ones, the arts 2000. Yeah, there are a couple paper. of them for which are uh, they all about 0.2 also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think I think it was around 0.2 for the for the B stars. Yes. Right. I, well, I don't expect that to keep going. No, no, no. It, it probably doesn't keep going. But here it's a, probably a special case where you have these small convective cores, and uh, it's not so surprising to to think that they should be a bit less extended than big big convective cores but maybe it's a bit naive. Last question to Mark. Uh, yeah, I kind of wanted to follow up on that because one of the issues here is that the pressure scale height itself becomes undefined at the center of a star and in the limit of a very small star, you get kind of an artificial bumping. And so there are alternate formulations of overshooting that are related to the physical size of the core rather than being to the pressure scale height at the boundary. And it would be interesting to see what you get there because I think that may capture the physics of these tiny little cores a little bit better. As I said to Ian yeah, yeah. Uh, just a minute yeah, ago, yeah. Uh, for these very low mass uh, yeah. cores, uh, the, what we use is not a fraction of the pressure scale ah, height, it's a fraction okay. of the, the, the core, the core itself. Yes. No, I'm sorry, we have to cut it off there. Uh, let's thank Sebastian again.